This episode is a completely experimental brew with the Brew One Hops and the Omega Hornendel Quebec Yeast. And to add one more thing into the mix, I actually have to ferment higher than the room temperature of Central Florida in the middle of summer. And it all starts now. Welcome to Big Monster Brewing. I am Matt, and in this episode, it is a completely experimental brew that I really have no idea what it's going to come out like. I have hopes, but I honestly don't know what this is going to taste like in the end. But before we get started, if you're new to the channel, please subscribe and hit that notification bell. We have some even more, I don't even know what the word, unexpected experimental brews right behind this one that if you enjoy what you see here, you're probably not going to want to miss those. So please subscribe and hit that notification button. And of course, if you have any comments or questions about anything you see here or anything about what I'm doing, please leave them in the comments. I would love to interact and answer questions and have some feedback. And I lost my train of thought there, but I think you know where I was going with that. So like I said twice now in the opening minutes of this video, this is an experimental brew. Now that the very limited, uh, the, or I should say the brewing for the very limited, the very scaled down competition season here in Central Florida is over, I have all the beers I'll need for what's left this year, which isn't much. But on the plus side, on a very big plus side, that leaves the rest of the year for me to pretty much brew anything I want. Any, We're talking styles, uh, anything, literally anything. I mean, it, uh, the... the the possibilities are really so endless right now, the words kind of escape me. And this is a perfect example of something that I want to try that uh, doesn't fit anything that I would ever do for a competition because I don't know what it's going to end up like. What I'm doing is trying out two things I have been very curious to brew with for a long time. First is the Brew One Hop. This is a hop that has, I think it's been around for a few years now, but at least in the brewing community that... I interact with has really caught fire this past year. It just, people are raving about it, mainly about the amazing tropical fruits this thing, this this pop adds in late editions and in dry hopping. And a thing they, everyone seems to point out is pineapple. And I absolutely love pineapple flavoring, or uh, pineapple, I should say. Uh, just, uh, it's one of my favorite lifesavers. I like pineapple itself. I'll even eat it on pizza. Sorry for anyone that just turned off that video. And I have had beers with pineapple added and pineapple notes from the brewing. So this hop, the way it's been described, has completely like caught my attention a while ago. And I've been dying to try something with it. Along with that is there's several strains of Kvike yeast now available. But one is a Hornendal that... Omega yeast has been putting out the home brewers, and one of the one of the many distinctive things about this particular Kvike yeast is well, of course, let's actually start with the Kvike yeast itself. It ferments well without all flavors at high temperatures, and I mean high temperatures. And we're going to get into that in this episode. So don't really have to worry about fermentation control uh, like you normally would with most beers. It's kind of a set it and forget it kind of thing. But the thing about this Hornendal strain that caught my attention and why I want to use it in this experiment is that the higher at the higher temperatures and we're talking in the 90s range it produces a ton or supposedly we're going to find out a ton of fruity esters again in the tropical fruit range and the two main ones that people pointed out are mango and pineapple so you kind of probably put two and two together here and see where this is going I'm basically trying to see how much pineapple flavor I can load into a beer without a single molecule of pineapple anything touching it, be it natural or artificial. So that's the experiment, and that's what we're going to brew today. So to start off everything, we need a very simple grain bill that's not going to get in the way of those flavors that the hops and yeast are going to bring, but that will produce a beer that will support those flavors. And that starts with a huge base of 88% pale malt. To that, we're going to put in just a little bit of color and flavor to that in the form of 5% of crystal 10L malt, 
and along with that, another 5% of Crystal 20 malt. And then just to give a little bit of body to this, again, to support all those flavors, the last 2% is going to be made up of Carapils malt. Once again, I am brewing a two and a half gallon batch on the 6.5 gallon Anvil Foundry. And this brew will start with reverse osmosis distilled water. And for my mineral additions, I am aiming for a yellow dry water profile as laid out in brewing water this time. And I will set my mash temperature for 152 degrees and start recycling the water as it heats up. While I wait for the water to heat up, I mill the grains. And once that water does hit 152 degrees, I mash in and I keep the recirculation going through the entire one hour mesh. With the usual hour to wait for the mash to convert everything to the sweet wort, it's time to get the boil additions ready. And while this beer is largely, if not, well, I guess in a sense, it's focusing on, it's not solely because I'm about to mess that whole term up, it's focusing on the brew one hop, I do want to give a little bit of a bitter backbone to have this beer taste like a beer, if that makes sense. And I think by doing that, it's going to give me a better idea of what the brew one does all together to a beer, as well as trying to drive that pineapple flavor out of the hop. So to do that, the first addition in this boil is going to be 40 IBUs of Magnum hop, a very clean, very straightforward bittering hop that I've used in a I don't even know how many recipes at this point. Now the rest of the hop additions are all going to be brew one and I'm not really worried about the IBU measurements at all. I just want to load this thing up with brew one hops in the aroma and flavor additions and try to drive that pineapple flavor out of them. So instead of really worrying about IBUs, I am going with nice rounded weights. So the first charge is going to be one full ounce of brew one at 10 minutes. Second charge will be one full ounce of brew one at one minute. And then those are both going to be accompanied by a one ounce charge of dry hopped brew one after primary fermentation completes. And along with all that, I have my usual boil additions of yeast nutrients in 10 minutes and just a little bit of a Warflock tablet at two minutes. <laughs> For the last 10 minutes of this mash, I raise the temperature to 158 degrees Fahrenheit for the mash out. Then I lift the malt pipe basket and set up for the sparge, which is one gallon of 168 degree water. And while sparging, I set the foundry to boil and wait for this sweet wort to get up to temperature. Now, while I'm waiting for the boil to start, I have to set up something that seems very strange to have to do for this time of year in this part of the country. Like I said before earlier in this video, the Hornendale Kavike yeast produces very strong tropical fruit flavors, including pineapple, in higher degrees of fermentation temperature. In fact, its optimum temperature is 70 degrees to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, which is like the low end of that is already five degrees higher than almost anything I'm comfortable fermenting at. So my house, room temperature at this time of year, which when I'm brewing this is the end of July, is some floats between 76 and 78 degrees. So it's, it's in the range, but the higher the fermentation temperature, the more those fruity esters come out. So I want to get it higher. I did put a thermometer in the garage, in the center of my garage, to see what the ambient temperature was, and on random checks... During the day, basically. Night, it was what I was looking for, but during the day, is well over 100. So I didn't want to push the seas past its optimum temperature range. So I compromised. I am setting something up to keep it in my house and give it just a little bit of a boost from room temperature to get it somewhere floating between 85 and 90 degrees while it ferments. So to start with, I grab this insulation wrap that I use for my Fur Monster 7-gallon carboys that I had gotten with the Brew Jacket Immersion Temperature Controller. Now, I only have the cooling version of the Brew Jacket, so unfortunately I can't use that to maintain a consistent temperature because there's no heating element on it. But I can use this insulation wrap to maintain the temperature that I hope to get this uh, fermenter up to. And to do that, I did find this 25 watt fermenting pad that should be just enough to get that temperature 
to 85 degrees and hold it with a big assist from this insulation jacket. So for now, I set up the pad inside the insulation jacket, but there's a few more things I'll have to add once I get the carboy inside, and we will see that in just a couple minutes. When the brewing is done, I chill the wort to just below 90 degrees because that is also the pitching temperature for this beer, which is strange to say. I transfer the wort, I take it inside, and I can pitch the yeast right away. No cooling the wort this time because it's at the temperature it, the yeast wants that wort to be at. And I plug this heating pad into an Inkbird temperature controller that I keep set at a cozy 85 degrees. And I also attach the Inkbird temperature probe to the side of the carboy to monitor the temperature. I do expect a big fermentation right off the bat, so I immediately put a blow-off tube on the top of this carboy. And then in just three hours, I see a ton of activity from this yeast already starting. I checked it again and took some footage of it 24 hours later, and I took some more footage of it uh, two days later because this yeast is just really blowing my mind at this point. I measured the beer six days after fermentation and it was down to 1.008. So it was done. And in fact, I think this may have been done a couple days before that. I was just a little late measuring it. I still have to add the brew one dry hop. So I do put this carboy in one of my fermentation refrigerators and get the, the temperature down to 65 degrees. I add the dry hops for three days, keg the beer, and carbonate to about three volumes of CO2 with the Blickman Quick Carb. Get it on tap and get it ready to taste. It is tasting time for What Could Go Wrong. That's what I decided to name this, considering all the uh, experimental things we did in this. And I'm really looking forward to tasting this. I'm always looking forward to tasting the beers, but this one in particular. First, let's take a look at it. This is fresh off the tap. The head has dissipated a little bit, but when it poured, it was quite... Uh, Billowy, I guess? Very soft, white, thick head with a lot of really tight bubbles, which you can still see. I'm trying to see if I can see on the screen here. You can kind of still see how tiny and soft those bubbles were. So this head did fill the glass until it took me time to set everything up to record this. Um, color, as you can see, it's a rich, I'd call that a rich gold. That is definitely in the gold territory, not in amber uh, quite yet. Hazy, which I did expect from the amount of dry hops I put in this, uh, which leads me to the first thing that I did notice while pouring this, I didn't get that usual kind of hop punch that you get from a dry hop. And I'm not sure what the aroma I'd be call, or that I would call is missing because up until now, I'd always call it a hop aroma. Uh, and it's not quite in this, or at least it wasn't when I poured, but we're gonna find out right now as I take a closer look. And it's still not there, but it's, I think it does have a hop aroma. And this is what I'll have to explain. And I didn't want to get to that until I, I took a closer look. So that normal aroma that you would distinctively call hops is not there. But one thing that is there that I kind of did expect based on the yeast and the hops we used is a very distinct pineapple. And if it's coming from the hops, I guess there is a hop aroma, just not the one you'd expect. I'm not sure. It could be a combination of the two. Here's the thing about that pineapple is that it is a very ripe, fresh pineapple, not a candied pineapple, not a uh, artificial pineapple. That smell is fresh and very ripe pineapple. I mean, really 
juicy, almost falling apart if you've ever had a cut a pineapple right at its peak and it, that, that pulp almost falls apart and it's super juicy. That's exactly what this aroma is. And that is all there is in the aroma is pineapple. So I guess let's get the tasting and I'll talk more about what I think is happening if I even know. So let's find out what this tastes like. On the initial taste, I do get a hit on bitterness um, kind of on the finish. That's probably from that early edition Magnum. But throughout this entire, that entire tasting I just did, which was fairly lengthy for an initial, initial tasting, very sweet, but not that undesirable, unfermented sugar sweet. Like it's not under attenuated. We know that. We took a measurement. We know this is not under attenuated, but yet there's a sweetness to it. It's kind of amazing how two different sweetnesses in a beer can come across as as very two different experiences. This sweetness is pretty incredible. It's very pleasant, very tasty, and under attenuated sweetness is almost like too much. It's cloyingly sweet. It's sticky. It's kind of just it's it's unpleasant after way too much of it. You can take a little bit of it in some cases. Maybe you can even finish it, or maybe it's complimenting the beer, but in general an under attenuated beer it's a different taste than this sweetness. I'm going to take a short sip because I did take a short sip walking over because I couldn't resist. And I want to see if I pick up this flavor again. I'm not picking up as much. Not my palate is adjusted. I will say the very initial s short sip was a very sweet, almost candy pineapple, like a somewhere between a lifesaver and those really cheap, like oval, sugar candies that everyone has had, but no one ever buys. They're just around. It's like they're a little oval with a dent and a little circle in the middle where the, I think the mold popped them out. Everyone has had them. I don't think anyone's ever bought them. They just exist like fruitcake. I'm not getting it as much now that my palate's adjusted, but that first sip, I was like, there's, there's the pineapple and it's still there. The beer part of this beer, meaning the malt and the hops, and I guess an extent to the yeast, the, the, the malt is really what I wanted to talk about. Not a large, presence of the malt accounted for and that was kind of by design we made a pretty benign grist it was to make a decent base beer but it wasn't going to be malt focused not a lot of specialty malts just some really strong base malts in this and um it's it's a good support for this for this beer uh for the what the hops and the yeast are doing i should say the weird thing i'm having trouble with is I mean, it's it's. I, I expected this to be way more of a hop that I'm familiar with than this fruit. So I'm not. It's not quite. I'm not going to say it's definitely not disappointing at all, but it's a surprise, and I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with the knowledge of this hop and this yeast together now. But I'm going to take another taste and see if now that it's kind of sit and it's been in my hand, it should be a degree or two warmer. If there's any kind of more um, character coming out of it. I will say if there's any other profile to this, along with the very noticeable pineapple, is that it's kind of got a general tropical fruit taste. And with that, I can't really pinpoint like a mango or, or papaya or anything like that. Maybe a little bit of citrus on the lime side, which is interesting. I would say I get a kind of a lime flavor out of it, but there's more of a tropical fruit flavor with that, kind of like a fruit punch, but not as sweet, like kind of like... Uh, Hawaiian punch, if you took a, maybe half the sugar out, there's that along with this too. It's a whole bunch of things all together. The body's fantastic. I mean, it's just this nice medium middle of the road body that is complementing that fruity flavor too. I think a really interesting thing to do with this beer uh, if I, I don't think I'm going to have much of it much longer <laughs> the way I'm enjoying this, but maybe in the future, um, if I have the time and the extra money for an entry, is enter it as a fruit beer and declare pineapple and see if that's noted as being present by some experienced palates uh, in a form of judges because it is it's pretty amazing how much pineapple flavor, even more aroma, I'd say it's more in the aroma that there is without there being a single drop of any kind of pineapple in this. This has been a fun experiment. 
I don't know what I'm going to do with the information I got from this, but it's been really fun. This is really crazy how fruity this is with just your four major ingredients, water, malt, hops, and yeast. That's, that's all that's in this. And I'm going to taste one more to close this out. I had a little bit back on the finish to see if it's uh if I get more of a malt profile from this. I don't. It's just that all the biggest flavor is fruit, pineapple first, and then a, just a, a a very pleasant mix of all kinds of stuff after that. And that lime's kind of moving into more of just a general citrus. Again, maybe now that my palate's adjusted to it, but crazy, crazy how fruity this beer is without a single. Uh, anything of fruit in this, which I've already said. I don't know why I'm repeating myself. I'm that surprised. So I'm going to be talking more about this beer on our podcast. We do have a podcast version of this show, which I don't talk much about. It's where me and some of my beer drinking friends get together and trade beers and discuss them, beers that we can't get where we currently live. And obviously all those co-hosts cannot get this, but they will, or at least one will, and we'll probably talk about this again. So if you want to Know more about that show, check out neozaz.com and look for Big Monster Brewing, and it's the podcast featured there. So with that last plug, I'm going to say thank you for watching another Anvil Brewing video in the works right behind this. And then after that, an even more interesting experiment with deliberate additions to get a flavor profile coming soon after that. So if you haven't already subscribed, please do and hit that notification bell, because if you like the results of... Uh, this little experiment, that one might interest you as well. So let me say one more time, thank you for watching and I'll see you in that next episode.